Good morning. Today is 8 September 2019. We're out in Noakesville, Virginia at the Open House and uh, this is Jay Waters with the Voices of Freedom Project in the Americans in Wartime Museum and I have the pleasure this morning of interviewing Kurt Philip Bauer. I, I understand you go by, by Phil? Go by Phil. Yeah, yes. okay. Well, if you would, just if you give us your, your full name and uh, where you were born and what year you were born. Sure. Uh, my full name is Kurt Philip Bauer II. Um, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was born in 1966. 1966. Okay. And what uh, what conflicts did you participate in? What wars? Uh, directly participate as far as deployed into uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, okay. and I did that service from Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Which is where the Air Operations Center was located uh, at that time. Although it has since moved down to uh, to Al Udeid in Qatar. And what year were you there in Saudi Arabia? Uh, I got there in February of 2003, and then I left early in May 2003, just before they moved to the Air Ops Center, and we were pretty much done with all the major combat ops at that point. Okay. And did you have any other family members that had participated in the military? I did. Uh, my father graduated from Pennsylvania Military College, which is now called Widener University, uh, and he graduated in 1952, and when you graduated in 1952 and got commissioned, uh, it was only a matter of time before you got sent to Korea, which is where he did his service. He was just a little too young for World War II. Sure. Was he with the Army or...? He was Army, yes. He was an Army Lieutenant. He was in the 24th ID, as I recall. Okay. Excellent. And uh, kind of jumping back a little bit, do you remember where you were and just tell us about where you were on 9-11 uh, when that occurred? Oh, yes. I remember exactly. Because I was on 9-11, uh, I was on... Well, I was in Arizona, and I think we were on West Coast time because they don't do uh, daylight savings time. And so for me, I mean, that the first attacks happened in, I don't remember the exact time, but it would have been six something in our time. And I don't normally have the news on in the morning or really any TV. And I was just getting around and was, you know, getting breakfast, walking the dog. And all of a sudden my sister calls, which was odd because it was odd for her to call, especially on a weekday morning. And she calls and she's like, do you, do you see what's happening? And I said, no, I don't have the TV on. She said, the, she said I, the plane just hit the World Trade Center and I think one just hit the Pentagon. I was like, oh, geez. So I, then I turned the news on. Of course, it was just transfixed. Uh, I'm not sure if that was right before or right after the second plane had hit. And I'm just sitting there watching, of course, this all unfolded and then realized, oh, I probably ought to get to work. Uh, and then I did, and of course it took about two and a half hours to get into the base at that point because they had already locked down a lot of things. Yeah, what, what base were you serving at? Uh, I was at Davis Monthan Air Force Base sure. in uh, right near Tucson, Arizona. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that was a that was an interesting day. A uh, lot of really, what's interesting is even the people who had who had access to uh, you know classified information and all these different sources. There was for about two straight days, and we were in an intelligence unit, and for two straight days there was nothing. And I think as everyone was sort of catching up and trying to analyze what had happened, and then after, by about that Thursday or Friday, finally this flood of information starts coming in that we start to look at and, and you know, kind of figure out what we're going to do. Right. Were you working some long hours right after? Not, uh, honestly, like I said, the first couple of days there was really, all, we sat around and, and watched CNN yeah. uh, okay. the whole time because there just, there was no other source of intelligence coming in. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it, it really, it seemed like a long time, but it wasn't too long. And as, as I told you before we started recording, because we had the only deployable air operations center in the Air Force, uh, they were a little concerned that this, the Saudi Arabians may or may not uh, be as uh, be as helpful uh, and let us keep the base there if we were going to go in and do something against Afghanistan or Iraq. So they deployed an alternate air operations center down to Al Ud what became or what was Al Udeid Air Base, and then became you know where the op center is okay. now a couple years later. Okay. Um, what got you into the Air Force? Why did why did you join the military? Um, Honestly, I, I was interested, I mean, I don't know if it was directly because of my father's service, because he had some in, interesting and colorful stories that they weren't always, uh, uh, I don't know, he, he just had some interesting stories, but, but of course his, most of his experience was wartime, most of his active duty time was during Korean War. Um, 
so I didn't, uh, it wasn't like he, certainly he did not push me. He neither, neither persuaded nor, nor forbid me uh, from going in the military, but it was not a thing. When I was in college, I got very interested in the mid 80s and I started going to the recruiters and saying, hey, you know, what if I wanted to go in the military, what would I do? Uh, at that point, I was already two and a half, three years into my college, so pretty much they all said, well, you know, keep your grades up, graduate, and you might, you might be eligible to go o OTS or OCS, depending on the service. Uh, and I talked with a few folks, I think, that were in ROTC or were like reservists that were going to school in the GI Bill, uh, and I started to get more and more interested in the Air Force, and um, so I didn't not right away anyway, but after I'd been out of school for two years and really wasn't doing much with my degree because I didn't want to go to grad school right away. Uh, then I applied to officer training school. Um, and I applied to officer training school and a, and a program to get my teaching certification and start teaching high school because I didn't want to do grad school right away. And they both came in at the same time and I, one of them I'd have to get take some student loans and, and suffer through 18 months of, you know, getting ready and getting ready to pay all those back and the other one I could get commissioned in five or six months uh, in exchange for and get paid and then in exchange I'd you know get treated badly for half a year and then be commissioned and I, that kind of it, it from the back of my mind from all those times when I was interested but not quite interested enough to pull the trigger so to speak I um, I went to uh, so then did the application took a while for various reasons, I and mean, we were in the middle of Desert Shield. Desert Storm was yeah. right as I, in between when I applied and when I went, we had already, you know, gotten upset, deployed all of our forces into the Middle East, fought a war, and were already pulling everyone or a lot of the folks back uh, before I even started. Uh, so yeah, so I started officer training school on 30 September 1991 at Lackland Air Force Base or Medina Annex when it was still located. 1991. Okay. Yep. Yeah, in fact, that was the next question. So, uh, about your initial training. So, what, what did you do? Was it o OCS or OTS? OTS. Yeah, the Air Force calls it OTS. Same thing. Um, Can you just tell us a little bit about that. It was uh, it was different. Like I said, not having done ROTC or, or anything like that, and not having any any close family members anyway or friends that were that were in the military, I had really no idea what to expect. Um, so, like I said, the, the process to get in was a lot longer. I thought, oh, in you know, three or four months, I, maybe I'll do one Christmas at home and I'll have to go. And it actually took, uh, ended up taking about 13 months to finally get the application and all the physicals and everything else and finally got, got started there. Um, it, was, uh, it was challenging <coughs> at the time, uh, probably the most challenging thing I had done. Certainly it was very intense. Uh, they try to combine as they try to give you a sort of a miniature version of the Air Force Academy in, well, originally 90 days, although it, it had kind of stretched out to about four and a half months when I got there. Okay. And then uh, when you graduated, were you, you were commissioned, what, as a second lieutenant? Yeah, commissioned as a second lieutenant on 12 February, 92, uh, and then went, immediately went off to my first training base, which was Vandenberg Air Force Base, to yeah. train to be a, a, a missileer, an ICBM. Uh, operator. Okay, and, and, and where is where is that base? Oh, Vandenberg is in Central Coast, California. Okay. So it's just north of Santa Barbara, about an hour. Yeah, and how, and how was that training? What, what would you do there? Uh, well, you train, to, you train to do a job that everyone hoped you would never have to do, which was launch nuclear weapons, you know, against uh, okay. somebody, probably the Soviet Union back then, because they still were the Soviet Union. And uh, also very interesting training. Uh, that took obviously much more relaxed than officer training school. Um, that took about, I think it was about four months. Okay. Yeah. And any other training before you get went to your first duty station? No, no. That was that was what you needed for that, and then and then you went right off to I went right off to uh, Minot, North Dakota. Oh, uh, congratulations. Yep. Well, how was Minot, North Dakota? I hear all kinds of jokes about it. But. Yeah, it's most of the most of the stories about how bad Minot is are usually told by people who've never been there or never been stationed there. Uh, it's it wasn't as much of an adjustment for me. Uh, it, Minot's about forty thousand people. The town I grew up in in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, is about forty thousand people, and so that wasn't a big shock to me. The big thing for me was the and and even the winters weren't. I mean, they're yes, they're they're pretty harsh, but. Uh, 
for me, it was really the remoteness. This, the, everything was so far away. You know, it took you a five-hour drive to get to Fargo, and then another four hours past that to get to a decent-sized town in Minneapolis. Um, so it, yes, just everything was very spread out. And and at the time, as a second lieutenant, you know, that was it, it was about three hundred fifty dollars to fly anywhere that I was interested in going to, just yeah. because Minot was at the very end of the end of the path for Northwest and United back then. Well, and were you one of those guys, I mean, the stereotype as an Army guy, uh, down in the, in the yeah. tunnels or the whatever? Yeah, can you yeah talk? exactly. Are you allowed to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, um, yeah, most of it. Uh, so ICBM operations has been around since, you know, uh, since the 60s with various different platforms. And at the time, and still now, well, at the time it was Minuteman and Peacekeeper ICBMs. Now we're, we just have the Minuteman. Uh, ICBMs that are still on alert in uh, three different bases, three different states in North Dakota, Montana, and uh, and Wyoming. Uh, that was also uh, interesting duty. Again, you had to be completely and totally committed and ready to do a job. Unfortunately, you know the best the best day was when you obviously when you never did that job. Uh, so it was kind of odd. You know, the, there's a lot of other career fields where you get to practice your job, security forces and, sure. and pilots and bombardiers and and people like that that will get to practice and, and chances are if they stay in long enough they'll actually get to do their job. But if your sole job is do is being part of the you know, the nuclear weapons and and releasing them, then you're never gonna get to do your job if everything goes well. Uh, so it was it was different. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's an extremely difficult job, but part of it was sort of, you know, and, and the location too was keeping your morale up. And But having said that, uh, the people that I'm best friends with still uh, that I've met along the way in all my military service, uh, I'd say about 50% of them were people that I met at my first assignment in Minot. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to probably jump around a little bit, but uh, sure. before we started, you were, you were talking about your support for OIF, so uh, just explain that a little bit more about going to Saudi Arabia, the type of unit you were in, and what you, what you were doing. Sure. Uh, so what happened was, um, so in the summer of 2002, we found out, and at the time we just kind of heard rumors, because if you weren't actually sort of actively part of this, you, you may have heard it kind of through the grapevine that we were making plans to do something in the Middle East, something with Iraq. But we didn't know what it was. Occasionally there would be a story, you know, an open source story in the news uh, that talked about uh, the Secretary of Defense was not happy with the plans that the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs had drawn up and told him to go back and do more. So we kind of knew that something was going on even though we didn't know exactly unless you were read into it and none of us were. And then in the fall of 02, I was actually at a different, at a five week training course down in Florida and I get a call from a friend of mine who's over at Shaw Air Force Base uh, in South Carolina and that's, that's where the 9th Air Force, which is the Air Force connected with it, same as it's AFCENT, Air Force okay. Central. Uh, and it was a buddy of mine that I knew f back from my Minot days that was now stationed there. He and I had both been through the Air Force Weapons School uh, about a year apart from each other. He's like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I got another week and a half of this class. He's like, well, can you be down in South Carolina and sometime, like a couple weeks from now, and bring all your deployment bags, including, including chem warfare? And I'm like, what are we doing? I can't tell you, but we'd really like you to be part of this team. So I said, okay. And a um, couple weeks later, I was back at davis Monthan, and then the, the orders actually came out. And indeed, we did bring all of our stuff. We did a rehearsal. Uh, for what became Iraqi <coughs> freedom, although right. we didn't call it that okay. then. And um, we, you know, we did a two-week kind of exercise where they, they briefed us in on what their plan was. And of course we didn't, uh, we didn't go right from there, but we had to be prepared to, I guess, just in case. Uh, we went home for Christmas, and then towards late January, they kind of let us know, hey, everyone who's been identified, uh, kind of get everything, get everything in order. I mean, we were already on mobility, but if you have any last shots to get or anything like that, you probably got to get that done soon. So that was sort of an indication that, that we were going to go. And then I ended up leaving the, the group of us, about 80 of us from Davis-Monthan left in, I don't remember the exact date, but it was somewhere around 
11 or 12 February of okay. 2003. And uh, what was your rank at this point? Uh, oh, I was a major then. Okay. And so then you ended up at your air operations center in, in Saudi Arabia. Just kind of, what would you, what'd you do there and how, how did that work out? So I did a couple different jobs there. We, we kind of, things sort of shifted around as, as priorities changed. I started out as the sole space guy because that had been, I had switched from ICBM ops to space operations. So I was the sole space planner in what they call the master air attack and planning cell. And so it was just trying to integrate the space effects and the things that space could bring to the folks fighting um, and making sure that that was all taken care of, that everyone that needed something from GPS or other sensors in space got what they needed. Okay. Um, yeah. And did the unit have a specific name? Yeah, it was the um, it was the 609th Air Operations Center, which was essentially when 9th Air Force would activate, they would create that in the same way that I was stationed at 12th Air Force. And we had we ever done that for, we were attached to SOUTHCOM, had we ever done that for, for South America, Central America, we would have been the 612th uh, okay. Air Operations Center if we stood up. So, it, and they're, they were all kind of arranged like that. The only difference is the Pacific and the European ones are constantly activated, okay. whereas the other ones require people to flow in. And did this remain a, a, a strictly Air Force operation, or did you, was it a joint type task force or other countries involved? Well, oh, well, yeah, uh, yes and yes. So it was, I mean, the way our operations centers are built uh, back then and, and, and still to today, uh, they're almost, if we're fighting a coalition, of course, we'll have coalition partners there. So just in the cell that I was in, we had, um, we had Australian and, and British counterparts okay. that were also doing missions and they were planning right alongside of us. And then uh, as far as joint service, uh, yes, uh, whenever they have an air operations center, there's always the representatives from the other three services. The, um, the BCD, the Battlefield Coordination Detachment, is the Army, the NAIL, the Naval folks, okay. Naval Liaisons, and then the uh, MARLO, which is the Marine counterpart, and also a Special Ops counterpart. So all those folks are there to make sure, um, you know, to make sure everything's coordinated. Okay. And how were your living conditions in Saudi Arabia? Uh, I, they're not, I mean, compared to what a lot of folks had, they were, they were pretty good. I mean, the way uh, Prince Sultan Air Base was set up was there was a, there was kind of the, the housing compound, which looked kind of like college dorms and, and had some recreation facilities and a track around it. And, uh, and then there was the actual operations center, which was several miles away on a separate secure area. And then we would just take shuttles or buses back and forth. The living condition, I mean, would have been like a college dorm room. Day to day when all they were doing was Operation Southern Watch, they had about 2,000 people there. Uh, just before we kicked off OIF, we had over 8,000 people there. So it was a lot. <laughs> I slept on a cot for a while because we couldn't find beds. And again, well, even majors get booted it, to the. Yeah, well, originally it was if, you know, more senior officers and senior enlisted folks had their own room. but. There's nobody, I don't think anybody below the rank of general had their own room uh, when we were, you know, so, I mean, they even had, they had army guys, they put tents down in the parking lots. Uh, it was so crowded as they were waiting to go to somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was cramped, but it was certainly not, uh, it, it was still pretty good living conditions. When, and did you guys have any combat operations there? Anything happened down there? No, no, they, they it was, it's interesting. They prepared for it because we didn't know uh, if Iraq still had saved any scuds or some other kind of missiles and of course there's always the chance of of some kind of infiltration although Prince Sultan Air Base is really in the middle of nowhere uh, in the desert so the chances of that happening were probably low but they did uh, about as I recall as a week or two before they built up these kind of revetments these uh, earthen film filled kind of erector set things that they would build up on all on the north facing sides okay. of the op center in, t in case someone did you know, try to take a shot at it from the north, from the direction of Iraq, just in case. Well, and, and as you kind of alluded to, the threat of the weapons of mass destruction, particularly like chemical attack, was, was very present, right? It was possible. Again, I don't think it was all that, uh, even had they had, you know, full up chemical munitions and the scuds to get them there, that would, that would have been a stretch. But yes, we had to be prepared. We all had our chem gear, we all had the training. 
uh, we did do a couple simulations just to see how much it would it would be bad if we had to be there in in chem gear and and work on uh, and work on computers and do briefings and all that and that would have been pretty bad but yeah. luckily uh, nothing like that happened definitely um, on a happier note were, were you married at the time right yes as a matter of fact I had just gotten married we we accelerated our wedding because yeah, even okay. though even though I knew uh, even though I knew I so I was scheduled to go to deploy at that time anyway. I was going to go for my three or four months over there in the desert to support Southern Watch. But we knew, as, like, as soon as I got called out to that thing in December, we knew it was going to be more than just a standard three or four month deployment. And of course, at the time, we had no idea. It could have been six months or a year exactly. or until it was done or, you know, we just didn't know. So we were supposed to, I don't even remember if we had scheduled it, but we were going to not get married until 2003. But we pushed it up to September of 2002, okay. knowing that that was going to happen and not knowing any of the kind of particulars right. about it. So. Well, h how were you able to stay in touch with you know, either your wife and even your parents or brothers and uh, you know, other, other family members? How were you? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't, again, it wasn't bad. I mean, certainly a lot better. We had a lot more access than, than folks that were actually, you know, pushing forward in, out of Kuwait and into Iraq. Um, but because of the number of people, the sheer volume of people, uh, you, know, you could get on, on a computer, but you could only be on for 15 minutes and it would kick you off and the next person you know, got to go in and there was always a big line. Uh, same thing with the phones. Uh, this was that obviously was pre, kind of pre-smartphones and even pre-cell phones that you could just take internationally without, you know, without getting a special one out there, which some guys did. Uh, I, I didn't. Honestly, there wasn't, I mean, we were doing, 12 and 14 hour days there wasn't a ton of spare time uh, for such things but I don't think I don't think we went more than a, a week maybe two weeks sometimes they locked down the, the phones and the, all the outside comms uh, for a while especially when we first kicked off okay. uh, OIF but r really we didn't have a lot of extra time uh, at that point were you still writing letters and stuff too getting mail we got yeah we never had mail shut off um, I don't remember if I wrote all that much, a, a bit here and there, uh, to some folks. But yeah, really, like yeah. I said, there wasn't a lot of there was not a lot okay. of spare time. Yeah, and and so one of the questions here is is if you if you did have any free time, uh, were there any recreation or activities that you participated in? There was uh, there well th that I yeah yes there were um, they kept everything pretty much going. Now a lot of us who certainly those of us who worked in the air ops center, almost everyone was on. 12 hour shifts which turned into 13 or 14 and for some of the guys not me luckily you know 17 and 18 hour shifts depending how indispensable they were um, but yes there were there were there was uh, they actually had a gym set up over where we worked which was good if you did have a lull of an hour or so in between things happening you could you could go over there they had a small running track around that compound then the compound where we lived had a lot more of those sort of facilities um, they they had to close the pool because so many of us had just gotten the smallpox vaccination, and because it's a live vaccine, they don't want people. Yeah. Uh, so that I don't think that ever reopened while we were there, uh, but they did. You know, they had a they had a movie theater, um, which I don't think I went to. Uh, that was really a bad. And they, of course, they had a track, and because Marines had been there before, they had pull up bars and a, and a fitness course all course, around the track yeah, as well. Yeah. That proudly proudly erected uh, by some uh, some group of Marines. They put little plaques on all the different workout yeah. equipment. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, well, are there any specific incidents that stand out during your deployment there? Either something like really bad or really, really good or, or funny or just unusual? Uh, I don't remember too many of the... Well, I, am, I mean, I almost... Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a funny thing where where uh, a, a general apparently wanted me brought up on charges because they thought I forged the three star signature uh, because he we, we were trying to get something done and we we're just trying to get something done quickly and uh, the chief of the cell where I was working he had kind of had enough of this this one individual down over at uh, over at Al Udeed who thought he was running things and like I think pretty sure our three star is running uh, everything connected with the with the AOC and 
So he was like, all right, that's fine. And so we went out, got the general, uh, our general, General Mosley, to sign something that had essentially told the unit, hey, your job is done. Uh, you guys can go home. You can rotate out. And then we, we sent that off, and the phone rang within about two minutes. And a buddy of mine who worked there said, he, he doesn't believe you got that signed that quickly. And I was like, whoa, well, hold on now. Is he accusing me of forging the general's signature? Because let me get this straight for the court-martial. Uh, as it turned out, that was, uh, yeah, nothing ever came of that. Of course, okay. I didn't. We, we just, we had access. He didn't realize, you know, we saw General Mosley every day. He had to come in where we were, uh, get usually a pretty short briefing, give us the thumbs up, and we went on and did our stuff. So it wasn't, you know, if we went to hit where he, where his area was there on the other side of the, that compound and said, hey, we need the general to sign this. And if he agreed, he would have it signed. You know, his aide would come sure. back within a half hour. And okay. was there. Uh, there weren't any, nah, I can't remember any, any other uh, really funny. Uh, there were some sad things. The one, one of the uh, fairly early on, I don't remember exactly the timing. Um, and I wasn't on, I would go to the ops floor just to deliver stuff, uh, deliver kind of the daily uh, file that would say what we were doing the next day and the space for the space guys in particular to look down and see what kind of support we were giving and uh, they described the scene to me uh, we at, early on in the in the conflict we accidentally shot down uh, one of our own planes mm. a British uh, tornado and whenever they have a down jet on the ops floor of course that's the focus of the attention if they think they have a someone who had bailed out uh, whether they got shot down or had a mechanic or whatever understandably that's the main focus they the, everything becomes secondary while they get that figure out the status of the crew and and getting the rescue attempt started and that what was really sad about it from our perspective was they they thought they had lost a jet then they said then they did a quick check-in where essentially they had check in with every uh, with every sortie every mission that's flying and they'll they'll go down the list and say, hey, report back any anybody who's missing. And they report it back and said, nope, everyone's there, and that's mm -hmm. great. Uh, and so everybody kind of relaxed and went back to whatever else they were doing. And then unfortunately, and then at some point along the way, uh, the other British, the wingman of that, uh, of that tornado crew kind of looked around and was like, hey, where, where's my wingman? Uh, and then that's when they realized. And, and unfortunately, even worse was it was our own it was our own Patriots. So. Yeah. So what, that was that was a pretty bad. Day. Was the pilot or the crew? Did they survive? Or no, they were lost. Was it no. a two-man two crew or a multi? Two. I think it's two-man crew yeah. for the tornado. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, I mean it. That's too bad. Unfortunately, the new Pack Three, the Patriot, uh, you know, the improved Patriot is is fairly. Le it's not a. It's not a proximity weapon like like the previous versions were. It's a, it's a hard contact, okay. so it actually t hits the jet and then explodes. And unfortunately, that's not good for the crew. Yeah. Did um, did you receive any awards either for yourself or unit awards for the deployment? We got, we got. I don't really think about <laughs> awards that much. More about just what we got, what we had to do. Um, we did get some kind of presidential citation, I think, for the the, the whole the entire Air Operations Center, and then you know individuals got got medals depending on what you did and sure. you know your your participation. So I'm sure I got some kind of joint medal of some sort. Well, what was it like coming back home then? Uh, it was it was different. I mean, when we left, we left not as a unit, although it was a bunch of people from uh, a couple of associated units there from Davis Moth. So we all left together. All the families were there, um, and you know, like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty. So there was certainly uh, my wife, my new wife at the time was was definitely not very was you know she, it's very unknown, uh, uh, and, and a lot of the families I think were like that. For us, it was really the first it was the first time I really had deployed into something like this, and uh, so it was a big send off. Though you know there was because uh, uh, we were all together. But then when we flowed back out of the theater, unlike you know some other things like like when a carrier returns or, or even an entire mm -hmm. uh, squadron, uh, you know different kinds of squadrons that deploy together and come back together. Uh, although we, like I said, we did, that group did deploy together, we all came back at different times and mostly on commercial air. So yeah. it, it wasn't, uh, 
it wasn't a really, you know, it wasn't a big ticker tape kind of thing. Uh, I did get to stop off on my way because um, we flew into Baltimore and my parents live not too far away from there. So I actually stopped for a couple days and, uh, and visited with them yeah, cool. uh, afterwards and then fl made the final leg and flew back to uh, Tucson. Okay. Well, I know we, we kind of just talked a lot about the, the deployment to Saudi Arabia, but you've had a, 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 you had a very long Air Force career, correct? Yeah, 24 years. Okay. And maybe like, what's your most memorable assignment besides what we talked about in Saudi Arabia? Uh, yeah, well, so my favorite assignment uh, definitely was uh, ROTC Detachment Commander, which okay. was my second to last assignment. And where that where was, was that? Uh, University of Illinois in Champaign. Okay. Uh, that was really, I mean, first off, it was command and you ever, you know, the, most most people, most career fields, most, you know, they're for, for the officers, they're trying to get you, you know, you should want to be in command, you should need, and not everyone does, really, but I certainly did. And when that opportunity presented itself, and I applied and got selected, and then got selected to that particular uh, ROTC detachment, you know that was uh, I was very excited about that. Unfortunately, it was only a two-year assignment, and it goes by really quickly. Yeah. Uh, but getting to work with not only being in command, which was fine, uh, it was being able to impact the lives of a lot of uh, a lot of young people that were just starting in the Air Force, yeah, cool. which was great. Uh, definitely my favorite assignment. Easily. Yeah, and probably like the Army. I mean, I, I recall the ROTC assignments were very competitive. It's it, yes and no. I mean, the, it, to it, get selected. I think. It, yeah, to get selected. I mean, it's it's a fairly good, fairly competitive pool. I mean, I know for for some of the career fields, they like it for two reasons. One, you get to be in command. You get to do something very interesting, uh, and probably something a lot different from what you've done before. And also, you the commander was like the only person that couldn't get deployed. Like I had, one of my captains had been there for three or five months and she got deployed. Oh, wow. uh, and and same thing with the other services, with the Navy, we had n both Navy and Army there. Okay. Uh, and same deal, the commander wasn't allowed to be deployed, but other people could be. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that wasn't such a thing for me. My career field doesn't deploy as, as frequently as others do. Sure. Well, and then uh, you retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. How about um, any promotion that you got along the way that really stands out to you? Uh, I mean, the lieutenant colonel one um, did for a couple of reasons. One, I finally got to have uh, my whole family there because I was at the Pentagon at the time and a lot of my family's okay. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So family and friends got to come down for that. Uh, that ended up being my last promotion. And I, you know, you're never sure, but uh, after 05, it gets very competitive uh, to the higher ranks. And so I was really glad that they could come to that. Um, yeah. Excellent. And how about your retirement ceremony? What did you do for that? Uh, we didn't have a big thing. I I had a retirement ceremony out. Of, I was at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, which is right right in Las Vegas there. Uh, so that was, it, yeah. I like I said, I didn't have a big kind of you know parade sort of thing. Okay. It was it was it was fairly low key. Uh, the 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 problem. You know, unless you're really lucky, the problem with retirement ceremonies is a lot of the people that you like to thank, that were your mentors or that influenced you on the way, or just people that you were stationed with that you um, that ended up becoming sort of lifelong friends. As a lot of people, like I said, from my first assignment, did uh, is most of those people probably aren't going to be there or right. be able to get out there yeah. for it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so it's sort of a lot of the people you end in your final assignment that you were working with. Uh, but not too many people from along the way, so. Okay. Well, looking looking back, and uh, now that you're out of the Air Force, how do you think your the Air Force your Air Force career has affected you now going forward? Well, certainly it directly affects me because I chose to go into defense contracting. So I'm, you know, a lot of the using a lot of the experiences that I had, um, and was lucky to to find a really good company to work for. The person that interviewed me was a retired Air Force One Star, okay. and he and I, although we were in different career fields, he was a fighter pilot, but we had done some similar things, and I think that that appealed to him, and, and he definitely, um, you know, not just the, you know, a little beyond just being a veteran from the Air Force, but, but some of the things that I had done. Um, so that was helpful in that, and uh, in, uh, in a lot of ways, or in, uh, in a lot of ways, 
uh, it's interesting to see my company that I work for um, has about, I don't know what the percentages is, in our, in my particular section that I work in, I'd say it's about half and half people who have some military experience to include uh, retirees, and then the other half is folks that, that don't, and many of them are, are fairly young. And it's interesting to the viewpoints that they bring in and, and sort of applying some military stuff. Some of it doesn't work. It only works in the military and it only needs to. And other things that, that really are, you know, like, oh, how did you think of that? I was like, well, I didn't think of that. The Air Force has been doing that for 40 years. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's interesting, the, the things that you bring into that without being like, oh, this is the only way to do it. Uh, but there certainly are some, a lot of good lessons learned out of that. Okay. Well, I've got two questions left. Okay. Um, so the second to last one is, is now looking, looking ahead to future generations, your maybe grandchildren or great-grandchildren, what would be the, the one thing that you'd want them to know about your Air Force, about you and your Air Force service? About me and my Air Force service? Um, Uh, I, I think it would be that that the that the Air Force, like all big organizations, and the military, I should say, like all big organizations, uh, from the outside it appears monolithic. Uh, it's all the same kind of people with all the same kind of backgrounds and beliefs and sort of worldview. Uh, and I found at OTS, uh, you know, my very first sort of exposure. And after about the first eight weeks, when you can finally look around and, and sort of meet some of the other people you're going through this with, was that was not the case at all. I mean, there was a, a wide swath of uh, of people, and I, for people who who decide to make the military uh, at least an experience or a way of life, if they choose to to stay in as a career, uh, that they remember that, and I think that's the strength. Uh, of our military is that is that it come it does bring people even even in an all volunteer force that we not only that we recognize that that's a strength but that we continue to encourage it. And that's that's well said. I, I agree. Um, and then the last question is always the catch all. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or I didn't ask or expand on? Um, it. It's funny, some of those things, I always think of the little sayings that, that people have, like, you know, they're, you know, for our branch of services, the Air Force isn't what it used to be, and it never was. You know, there's, there's all these things that people sort of assume, uh, and again, that they see things as very monolithic and non-changing. Uh, I remember even at, at officer training school, when they're teaching us all about TAC, SAC, and MAC, Tactical Air Command, Strategic Air Command, Mobility Air Command, all right, you need to learn this for the test and then forget it because this is all going away in less than a year because we had switched out of that sort of Cold War organization into, into something different. Uh, and, and that although the military may be slow to change sometimes, uh, that it does change a lot more than people think. You know, just, because, just because we hadn't switched the uniform for 30 years doesn't mean they hadn't switched philosophies and ideas. Uh, and it kind of goes in fits and starts just like every other aspect of society. It will go for a while without changing, but then then things do change. And I'd say more and more, especially these days, things will change at a uh, much quicker pace. Okay. Anything else? Nope, nothing else I can think of. Well then, Phil, on uh, behalf of the museum and the organization, we'll well, thank you. I want to present you. Uh, oh, thank you I'm very sure much. You're familiar with the challenge points. Maybe yes. hold it up to the oh. camera real quick. Get yep. No, it a was little a high, little higher. Yep. Yeah, there you go. No, and, it was, uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it was. Man, it's an honor to get to interview you today. Great. Thank you.